Good morning. Uh, my name is Mara Carlin, and I'm the Acting Director of Strategic Studies here at SICE. We are very excited to host the National Defense Strategy Commission rollout. Uh, as many of you will recall, uh, just a few months ago, Secretary of Defense Mattis sat on this stage, and he delivered his National Defense Strategy. Since then, there has been all sorts of debate in our classrooms and outside of our classrooms about the direction of that strategy, which focuses on competing with China and Russia and preparing for the possibility of conflict with both of them. In an effort to assess the strategy, Congress pulled together a bipartisan commission of incredibly talented defense thinkers across uh, the national security apparatus to come together and their job has been to do a scorecard, if you will, of the national defense strategy. Their report is stark. We have copies for you to read outside of here. But it is stark and it is indeed grim. Effectively, it says that in a war with China or Russia, the United States may lose. So today we have the opportunity to hear from the two co-chairs, Gary Ruffhead and Eric Edelman, who led this effort over the last year or so. Now, I would be remiss, of course, if I didn't take a moment to talk about the extraordinary Hopkins connection to almost everyone who was a part of this panel. So, as many of you know, Eric Edelman is a distinguished professor in strategic studies at SICE. Gary Ruffhead is a member of the Johns Hopkins board. Christine Fox, who is joining us today, works at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory on policy and analysis. We have Tom Mankin, who is a senior research professor here at SICE. And we have Kath Hicks, who's the Donald Marone Scholar at the Kissinger Institute. So if you do your math, nearly 50% of the people working on this effort are affiliated with Hopkins. Not a surprise, but always a, a pleasure. We also had a number of folks helping support the effort, including Professor Hal Brands and myself. So uh, I really appreciate you all being here today. Uh, the co-chairs testified before the Senate Armed Services Committee, and they are ready for even harder questions by Elliot Cohen and by the audience. And let me put it in their hands. Please join me in welcoming them. Well, thank you. Uh, welcome. The, the actual statistic that uh, Professor Carlin quoted to me is uh, something like 40% uh, of the people associated with this effort are one way or another Hopkins personnel, which is any larger than that, other people would notice and get uh, jealous. Um, so we're not going to dwell too much on that. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin by just asking Ambassador Edelman to amplify a little bit. What's the purpose of this commission? This is not the first time that uh, this commission has issued a report. You've been involved in uh, previous iterations of it. Um, and what's the utility of it, frankly? What difference does it make? in policy debate. Well, first, thank you, uh, Elliot, for um, moderating this. And thank you, Mara, for that introduction. It's great to, to be here uh, and associated with so many great Hopkins folks. And particularly, I'd like to uh, recognize Christine Fox, who was one of our commissioners. And I think Christine would agree. And I know Tom, is, Tom has just walked in, another uh, Hopkins-connected commissioner. Um, one thing that uh, Admiral Ruffhead and I said yesterday before the Senate, and which uh, was validated by another member of the commission, uh, Senator John Kyle, who, uh, because of uh, Senator McCain's passing, actually returned to the Senate after completing uh, his stint with us on the commission. Uh, and that is that the Congress uh, blessed us with a terrific group of commissioners. And one of the things that I thought was uh, particularly in our day and age, unusual about our deliberations was the fact that uh, although all of us were appointed by either a majority or minority member of the House and Senate Armed Services Committee, the chairs and the ranking, uh, in our deliberations, you would have not been able to tell in any way uh, who was you know, appointed by whom because uh, the deliberations were not just bipartisan, they were nonpartisan. This was a group of 12 dedicated Americans concerned about the future of the nation's security, wrestling with some very difficult problems, uh, as uh, Secretary Mattis and his colleagues who produced the NDS were wrestling. The Congress, in its wisdom, uh, 
dating back to the late 1990s, has periodically appointed panels to review the Department of Defense's uh, strategic uh, documents. Uh, in the 1990s, the requirement was created for a quadrennial defense review uh, that the Congress mandated the department produce every four years. Uh, in the late 1990s, they appointed a national defense panel to review those efforts by the Congress. Uh, and then starting really with the 2010 cycle, the Congress appointed a, a panel in 2010 and 2014 to review the, uh, the, the then QDRs. And in response to one of the recommendations of one of those panels, Congress actually did away with the requirement for a QDR uh, and replaced it with a requirement for uh, a national defense strategy. Um, and uh, they appointed a panel uh, in 2018 to review that strategy to do two things, uh, to, to try and help inform the strategy as it uh, developed, uh, although for a variety of reasons we were less able, I think, to do that than many of us would have hoped because of our, some mechanical problems got us started a little bit late. Um, and then to provide the Congress with a second uh, opinion. And uh, one of the things I was gratified about uh, in the hearing yesterday was that uh, Senator Inhofe, in his opening statement, has made clear that he intends to use this report essentially as a template for uh, his stewardship of the Senate Armed Services Committee's oversight of the department and of its implementation of the strategy. So I think that's a uh, great compliment to the work that uh, the commissioners have done, and I think a uh, demonstration of the utility of the entire exercise. Uh, Admiral Ruffett, uh, first welcome to SICE, or welcome back to SICE. Um, the, the report begins <coughs> with something of a commentary on the national defense strategy, which, as uh, uh, Professor Carlin pointed out, was rolled out on this stage. Uh, could you just highlight for us briefly what, what are the areas in which the commission concurs with the national defense strategy, and if you could just kind of give us some headlines for where it, it, it thinks that there are gaps or where it actually disagrees with the NDS. Well, thank you, and, and I would just like to reinforce Eric's comments. The, uh, the opportunity to work with the commissioners uh, and the tone that existed and the opportunity to just really talk through some hard issues was truly extraordinary. Uh, you know, all of us uh, have had an opportunity to participate in endeavors like this, and, and uh, for me, uh, this was as good as it gets, uh, and I mean that sincerely. Um, but, um, you know, as the, the report states, we uh, believe that the strategy was a pretty good description of the challenges that we face and uh, is a, a very good first step in heading, you know, pardon my nautical references, but getting the, the ship headed, headed in the right direction. Um, <clears throat> there's no question uh, that uh, we are in a different strategic environment, that we are now having to uh, deal with uh, peer competitors. Um, <coughs> I would argue one more significant than the other, that being China. Um, and, and what we have been involved in over the last essentially two decades, uh, the wars in the Middle East, are, are a different kettle of fish than what we have to look forward to in the future. We also, uh, I, I would say we're in agreement with the uh, national defense strategy in that the new technologies that are coming on scene are going to change warfare significantly. And um, exactly what that will be you know, is still to be determined. You know, how quickly will you see AI find its place in, uh, in warfare, uh, autonomous vehicles, um, different means of communication, what will be the impact of, of quantum uh, communications and computing. Those things are, are coming at us, and I think that the strategy and, and, and our focus was on that as well. Um, the idea of, of having to 
uh, focus in three geographic areas, um, Russia's playground in Europe, the Middle East, and then uh, the, the Indo-Pacific, uh, as it's now being called. And dealing with the two peer competitors, but also having to uh, remain vigilant and mindful of Iran, uh, North Korea, and then uh, the jihadist movements that will likely continue for some time. Uh, so good agreement there. What our report calls for is what is next, and I think there's plenty to talk about in that regard. Okay. Um, well, let me uh, plunge into something that Professor Carlin uh, referenced. Uh, there's some pretty stark language in here. So on page 14, <coughs> uh, the report reads as follows. If the United States had to fight Russia in a Baltic contingency or China in a war over Taiwan, Americans could face a decisive military defeat. Against an enemy equipped with advanced anti-access area denial capabilities, attrition of US capital assets, ships, planes, and tanks could be enormous. The prolonged, deliberate buildup of overwhelming force in a theater that has traditionally been the hallmark of American expeditionary warfare could be vastly more difficult and costly if it were possible at all. Put bluntly, the United States military could lose the next state versus state war it fights. Uh, I don't think I've ever read anything like that in any kind of official document before. Would I be correct in thinking that you would not have said that 10 years ago? That's correct. Ed, um. Um, can I ask whether the Pentagon shares that bleak in assessment? Um. Well, let me uh, answer that by backing up a little bit, because this has been uh, a kind of long-term development. Uh, because I'm a recidivist and have served on the 2010 and 2014 panels as well, um, if you go back and look at what the 2010 panel said about the then uh, QDR and the prospects, it, it, just to remind people, at, at that point, Secretary Gates was saying that the United States had chewed up a lot of capital stock over the previous uh, decade or so of uh, fighting the, the war on terror, and that uh, it needed to recapitalize in the face of some looming challenges. And he said that he needed, he thought, one and a half to two and a half percent real growth annually in the defense budget in order to accomplish that and do all the other tasks that the department has before it. Our panel actually said, we agree with the direction that the Secretary is trying to move in. We think he's underestimating how much he's going to need. We think he's going to need more than that. Um, and we said, as far as we could see, and I'd like to just point out, we were a little bit prescient. This was before the uh, Bipartisan uh, Budget Control Act was passed um, in 2011. We said we saw a train wreck coming with the, the sort of looming challenges that the country faced. and the budgetary trajectory that we were on at that time. In 2014, the panel after the BCA was passed said we thought that was a strategic misstep. And that was taking place in a context uh, where while we were writing the report, uh, the uh, Russian Federation was uh, invading Crimea, uh, destabilizing eastern Ukraine, and, and uh, in the face of from 2010 to 2014, uh, growing concern about Chinese activity in the South China Sea and in the East China Sea as, as well, uh, and in a, a context in which the Department of Defense was not yet willing to say that we were back in an era of great power competition, but it was becoming more and more apparent that that's where we were, in fact, headed. The national defense strategy that the department rolled out here at the beginning of this year clearly recognizes we're in an era of great power competition, prioritizes that uh, for the future of the, um, uh, of the defense effort of the United States, recognizes, I think, that the trends have become very adverse to us because our allies have been, our, our adversaries have been developing capabilities that make it harder 
for the United States to uh, come to the defense of its allies uh, in extremis, um, and that if those trends are not reversed, we could be in, in difficulty. I think they're still loath, as understandably, to say that we might lose uh, a conflict. But that's the logical, I think, conclusion that we drew from looking at where these trends are headed, absent something changing them. I mean, if we uh, engage in more defense budget cutting after two years of buying back a little bit of readiness uh, over the last two years, uh, those trends are, are going to accelerate. Admiral uh, Roughhead, um, I mean, again, I'm, when I read that, that, those words really leapt out of the page at me. Is this because we haven't invested enough in your judgment, or we've invested in the wrong things, or is it just the result of having potential adversaries who have, you know, have very considerable resources and we can't do everything? I mean, I'm sure it's some mixture, but could you yeah. kind of characterize the <clears throat> mixture for us? I, th I think it's uh, a combination of things, as you allude to. Uh, it's the investments, uh, very focused, thoughtful, coordinated uh, investments that are being made in capabilities and capacity that is designed to uh, stymie our efforts. Um, it's, it's really quite well done in, in my mind, particularly on the part of, of China. I think it is a function of um, um, watching uh, our readiness degrade over time, uh, again, uh, largely driven by loads that are on, being put on a smaller force, but at the same time, um, um, you know, disruptions in the budget uh, process and flow that goes to the military. I see one of your current students here, Nick Grady, who um, uh, served with me on, a, on another review that we did on readiness for the Secretary of the Navy. Um, when you look at um, how that came to pass. It is many faceted. Yep. Um, and, 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 you know, we can talk about the Budget Control Act, but I would say in the readiness area, it is the inability for the services to have a predictable flow of funding that comes in that allows you to maintain very, very complex systems. I would also say that it is a function of being focused on the war that we are in. Um, which is not as complex as what will be presented by China or Russia, particularly in our ability to dominate air, space, and sea space. Uh, you know, we move things in and out of the Middle East without having to worry about um, undersea attack. We fly at will in the areas of Iraq and Afghanistan and do not have to worry about uh, high-end uh, anti-air systems. Uh, we are facing in the future uh, not just ballistic missiles, but long-range strike, and the advent of hypersonics turns a lot of that stuff on its head. So all of, of, of this is coming to pass, so it's a, a focus on the fight that we're in. It's financial. And, and I think it's not um, th thinking through uh, the types of operational concepts yep. that are going to have to be developed for the, the future. And those operational concepts are going to have to evolve because there'll be some that we will develop for what we have and how to get the job done. But then we also have to be thinking about the operational concepts that will have to change because of the new technologies that I mentioned at the beginning coming into inventories, ours and theirs, that will require some thinking, and not just thinking about them, but then having to test them, having to game them, and then having to go out and have our young men and women practice them. So, you know, that yeah. is a long answer, but I'm, uh, I'm, it's, it's many faceted. I'm going to uh, come back to the issue of operational concepts, but I, I want to press a little bit further. Obviously, this has large foreign policy implications. If we really think that there are parts of the world where there's a good chance that if the United States tries to engage, 
you know, something like Taiwan that is just going to be too bloody and, and we might actually lose. Well, there are large things that, that, uh, that flow from that. So let me throw out a, a, an argument to you and hear your response. I think there would be some people would say, well, look, um, even if we would prefer a world in which the United States could project power in the way that it could in the 1990s and early 2000s, the fact is, you know, the Russians have to some extent recovered. As you said, they're very focused. Uh, but above all, the Baltic is their backyard. And for that matter, Crimea and the Ukraine is their backyard. And that's even more true in some ways with China, with a, an economy that's still growing faster than that of the United States, and which you know, some people believe will equal that of the United States or even surpass it. Uh, again, it's their backyard. We have to get in. Uh, they, it's a much easier proposition for them. So to some extent, is this, are we in competitions which, no matter how clever the operational concepts, and even if there's an additional slug of resources, it's going to be kind of a mug's game, because we can't really, in the long run, hope to uh, ha have the capability that we did, say, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, um. So maybe if you and then yeah no Eric. I would say that I, I think that's the that's the challenge um, and 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 it and it's how do we deal with those circumstances uh, what are the the investments that we really need to start making the priorities of those and then uh, in those geographic areas how do you cooperate with allies and partners and and it is also um, not just okay how are we going to put a plan together to go do something I think that we um, uh, we identified in the report and I know the department is working on this is how do you drive to uh, increase technical uh, cooperation and co-production opportunities uh, with the particularly the high-end allies but if I could just push you in that, is, is what you're saying that particularly if, we, if, if we're A, smart, and B, we work closely with allies, it is still a doable do? If we make the right investments, if we think through uh, how to optimize those investments with innovative concepts, I think it's a doable do. If we simply um, talk about um, you know, the, the problem, I'm not sure we're going to move ourselves down the road. Ambassador Edelman, you want to pitch in on this? Yeah. So I don't think our objective was to describe our potential adversaries as 10 feet tall and, uh, you know, the United States as a, to borrow a phrase from President Nixon, a pitiful, helpless giant. I mean, that's, that's not, I think, uh, the message here. But the message is that the world that we inhabited from 1992 on to some, maybe a few years ago, maybe 2014 or something like that, I don't know where historians will end up dating it, but one in which we had unimpeded access by air and sea to any theater in the world that we wanted, uh, and where we could allow aggression to take place and then feel fairly confident that we could roll it back with uh, a couple of weeks of intensive combat has ended and that we are in a different era today than we were before. This is something that Secretary Hagel actually talked about that we cited in, in the 2014 report, that the margin of advantage that the United States had over its, its technological advantage over its potential adversaries was declining and declining at a fairly rapid rate. Uh, I think our judgment was that there are a lot of members of Congress and a lot of people in the public who have not sufficiently appreciated this and that these trends are ongoing. And so uh, this shouldn't be read, I don't believe, as a, uh, a cry that, you know, all is lost, there's no hope here. Our adversaries have their own challenges and problems, they have some advantages. Some advantage is that because we have global responsibilities uh, and they have, uh, for the most part, regional ambitions, although China, I think, 
over time is developing more than just regional ambitions. But uh, they have a, a home court advantage, if you will, in any potential conflict. And we have to deal with the tyranny of distance, uh, certainly in the Western Pacific, but even in Europe. Uh, we've got, uh, we so diminished the forces forward that we had in Europe that now to get forces there uh, it takes, takes an effort on the part of the United States. I think the, the message people should take away here, and, and I think we should have a debate about, I mean, you've raised a question, I think that's a first order question, Elliot, and I think we ought to have that debate in the country, which is fundamentally this proposition. Since 1945, the United States has supported a certain kind of global order. Uh, it hasn't always been perfect, it hasn't always been pretty, but by and large, it has led to the greatest period of interstate peace and prosperity in the history of the world. The question is, do we want to continue to support that? And my view, and I'm speaking now personally, not for the rest of the commission, is that the most dangerous place for the country to be is to pretend that we still support that uh, and to pretend that we're still capable of executing those kinds of missions without providing the wherewithal to do it. That, to me, is very, very dangerous because it leads to miscalculation and war. But, but just to, again, to pin you down, you would agree it is a doable do with, with um, expenditures that you can reasonably imagine the United States government making and policies and concepts and so on. It, we can still do that even despite sort of other secular trends out there? If you look at the secular trends that Russia, the Russian Federation faces, for instance, with yep. its demography, and even China's demography is actually somewhat unforgiving, uh, they have very serious problems of their own. Uh, what I think we have to do is make the determination that uh, despite the burdens that it puts on the United States, and it does put a burden on the United States to support this kind of order, that it's still worth doing. And if we think it's worth doing, bending ourselves to doing it smartly, yep. I think it's still, it's still doable. We still have a lot of advantages. Given all the problems we describe in here, and I, thinking about Russia's problems or China's problems, I always recur to my you know, sort of simple-minded you know, question, Who's, whose problems would you rather have? Right. And I, I would rather have ours. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm going to move us on, but Admiral Raffhead, you had something you wanted to Yeah, and I think that. it's, um, you know, you really need to open the aperture on this because it's, uh, you know, getting to your point, is it a doable do? Um, I would argue that, uh, and we call it out in the report, uh, that in a way, um, because of the processes that we have created, for example, it is taking us far too long to get capabilities out into the, uh, into the operating forces because of the process that we've put in place. Um, you know, I often say that, that the Chinese have adopted our model of rapid innovation, and we have adopted the communist model of, of how we process capabilities through our system. Uh, coincidentally, right before the, the hearing yesterday, I happened to be looking at the, in the paper and, um, you know, 15 months ago, as Nick knows, the USS John S. McCain was involved in a collision, a uh, tragic collision, lost some sailors, but it was not one that was of the magnitude of a, of what I would call battle damage, uh, which we've seen before. Um, yesterday morning, or it was actually day before yesterday, the USS John S. McCain refloated out of dry dock. 15 months after a collision. Now, if we think that being able to restore capability back into the Navy, and if we think 15 months is okay, we've got a problem. And so that's where I think there can be some significant gains. You know, technologically, we're still, you know, king. But how do we get it out to the operators? And I think that's an area that China has really gone to school on. They're working very, very hard in that regard, and it's our game, and I submit we're losing it. So by comparison, I, I seem to remember that just before the Battle of Midway, which of the carriers was either Yorktown or Lexington had been very badly damaged, 
they get it into Pearl Harbor, and I think they turn it around in a day. I think it was or four. Two, a couple days. But, and they have it functional again. Right. And, uh, and there's no question. I mean, the complexity of the systems that we use today. But, but it's uh, striking. Right. And yep. then recently the GAO report on, you know, how many submarine days have been lost, things yeah. like that. Yeah. That's, that's our fault. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to press you for quick answers because uh, we're going to go through a bunch of things. And I also uh, I want to forewarn uh, my Hopkins colleagues. Uh, as we begin the q and I'll ask... Christine Fox and Tom Mankin, who are the two other <coughs> commissioners present, to, if they have just a couple words that they're going to want to put out. And I'll even ask uh, Professor Carlin what it was like to be on the staff of this enterprise. But let me uh, continue with a couple of other questions. I'm going to get to the budget in a moment. But the other thing that leapt out at me, uh, usually these kinds of documents don't have a whole lot on civil military relations. In fact, they don't mention it at all. And yet, this report actually talks about that. There are, there are a number of things, and again, you can find it, and I think we have some of the official copies out here. Uh, we came away troubled. We talked to a lot of DOD leaders. We came away troubled by the lack of unity among senior civilian and military leaders in their descriptions of how the objectives described in the National Defense Strategy are supported by the department's readiness, force structure, and so on. But, but I mean, there's an even kind of broader um, set of declarations and assessments which indicate that the commission thinks that there's something awry with the state of American civil military relations. Just can I start with you, Aaron Ruffhead, and then go to Ambassador Edelman? Yeah. Um, one, I, I would say that um, it's a small portion of the report, but we thought it needed to be mentioned. Uh, I think it's also important to uh, make it clear that this was not directed at any particular individuals uh, that are serving within the Department of Defense, nor is it something that is unique to this administration. Uh, it's been some, it, it has been happening over time. Uh, I was asked yesterday, you know, how, how did it, you know, where did it kind of begin? And I, and I think that the phase that we're in right now uh, has its genesis back in 1986 with the uh, advent of the Goldwater-Nichols Act, which has um, created large military staffs. We have invested significantly in professional military education for those who serve. So you have mass, you have significant intellectual power, and you also have a culture that does things very quickly and so the, the heft of the military uh, uh, ability uh, kicks in. I also believe that both in the executive branch and in the legislative branch, there has been uh, increasing deference to the uniform opinions and not uh, uh, to those of civilian leaders who are accountable for civilian control of the military. So uh, I think that's a trend. I, I you know, as a, as a retired senior officer, I do not believe that is a good model for our democracy. And, um, and, and our hope is that this will um, lead to some discussion on how that should be addressed. So Ambassador Edelman, I'd like you to comment on that if, briefly. And then I'd like you to also say, well, how do you fix that other than by having ferocious civilians such as Oh, yourself, and Christine, Christine Fox, and Tom Mank, and then Mara Carlin come roaring into the Pentagon. Note that Vice Dean Cohen asked me to comment briefly because he knows I'm not capable of saying anything. <laughs> um, just, uh, let me just make a couple of additional comments. I agree, of course, with everything that Gary um, said. Uh, first, it, this is not you know, a conclusion that Eric Edelman reached or Gary Ruffhead reached. This was a unanimous conclusion of the panel. Uh, which included not only, uh, you know, retired chief of naval operations, but also a retired four-star vice chief of staff of the Army, um, and several commissioners who, whose senior experience, like Christine's, like Kath Hicks, like uh, Michael McCord, uh, uh, is more recent than mine. Um, so uh, it, was, it was a unanimous view first. Second, uh, a lot of this, you know, has to do frankly, with the dysfunction of our politics and the, the uh, difficulty of staffing the civilian element of 
the Department of Defense. I mean, I mentioned yesterday in testimony that in the Bush 43 administration, when I was in office, we routinely had a 25 percent vacancy rate among the civilians. And the process, particularly, it's, it's an ordeal to get through the presidential appointment process if you're not a Senate-confirmed person. If you're Senate-confirmed, then it's, you know, truly an ordeal uh, that can take, you know, now upwards of a year and a half. I mean, the current administration went for a full year before it had an Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. There are still vacant Assistant Secretary positions in OSD policy. Um, for the reasons that, that Gary just articulated, uh, in the meantime, you've got business to be done, and you've got staffs that are, you know, very eager to do it uh, because that's, their whole training is, is to do that. And this is one reason why it's not anybody's particular fault. This is not someone, you know, it's not the chairman's fault or the secretary's fault or their predecessors. Uh, it's, it's just been an institutional problem. And the difficulty is that if you look back at the National Security Act of 1947, it essentially created a permanent situation in which there's going to be tension between civilians and the uh, military departments of the Department of Defense about the direction of defense policy. That's okay if the tension is managed in a constructive way, but you can't do that if, you know, one half of the equation is, you know, chronically understaffed and subject to tremendous personnel churn all the time, which is really what's happened over the last, I would say, decade and a half. No. Um, again, really uh, uh, quickly, um, budget. So, as a devoted follower of the president's Twitter feed, I, uh, uh, it's clear to me that uh, there's been this fantastic uptick on, uh, in defense spending, which has kind of undone all the, the damage done by uh, his predecessor. Something tells me that you actually don't agree with that, that what you're, say, what you're saying, which I think, uh, not to be facetious, is probably runs counter to what, you know, your average reader of the news would think, that actually the increased budget, uh, defense budget of the last two years has really not fixed a lot of systemic problems, that we are seriously underspending. And I'd, could you just explain that to us? I'll, maybe I'll start with Ambassador Edelman and then turn to you, Admiral Ruffin. Well, I mean, there are a couple of things, and some of this came out in the hearing yesterday. I mean, uh, first, we have these global responsibilities that requires us to be in, in the Far East. It requires us to be in Europe and the Middle East. We've, and we've got, you know, been at war for uh, 17 years. Um, that's point one. Point two, <clears throat> um, we were uh, cutting the budget. Well, if, to go back to the 90s, um, you know, after the Cold War ended, when we had this idea that, you know, we could, you know, we were the uh, unipolar power and uh, we weren't going to ever have to fight a great power war again, um, we took a, um, you know, a um, peace dividend uh, by reducing the, the budget at the same time that we were actually increasing the operational tempo of the, of the U.S. military. Uh, with the interventions in Haiti and uh, Somalia, Bosnia, Kosovo, et cetera. That was even before 9-11. After 9-11, we started chewing through equipment, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Secretary Hagel had referred to that, um, at a, a pace that was well beyond uh, what people anticipated. And then um, after uh, the uh, financial crisis, we started again to decrease the defense budget before the uh, BCA, you know, took, took effect. So you've got these sort of big kind of trends going on uh, that have buffeted the, the budget. Um, we've also had, because of the political dysfunction, an inability to actually, and this is something that Admiral Ruff had referred to and, and, it, and I think is very important. It's not just, you know, having a high level of resources, although that's obviously what I would prefer, but it's having uh, predictable and consistent funding, which we've been unable to procure for the Department of Defense because we've just had a series of bipartisan budget deals every couple of years interspersed with five or six CRs. And the CRs make it- In continuing resolution. I'm sorry, continuing resolution make it very, very difficult because 
not only does it impose a limit on the uh, a ceiling on the amount of money you can spend until you get an actual budget, but it also prevents you from having new starts. Well, what does that mean? That means you're pouring all the money back into what's in the program of record, and it makes it difficult to address the kinds of challenges that uh, you know Admiral Ruff had articulated that our adversaries have created for us because they've gone to school on how we fight wars, and they know how they can try and frustrate our ability to get someplace in time to make a difference uh, if if uh, you know, if deterrence fails and we end up in a conflict. But I think your point is, is very well taken because I do believe that there's a sense that, uh, that the two years of rather healthy budgets and then this year getting a budget uh, for the Defense Department on time that all is well in the world. And uh, when you look at the readiness accounts, for example, uh, there's a, that's a pretty big hole that has to be uh, filled going forward. Um, you know, the force that we are operating today, uh, the conventional force, was modernized in the 1980s. And, and, and it's, it's time uh, for a force for the future. On top of that uh, is the nuclear uh, recapitalization of the triad, which the report uh, That was my next question, the, actually. It was about the, the uh, nuclear question. Uh, the NPR, but embedded in all of that, uh, you know, we can be captured by the fact that there's a new bomber, there's a new submarine, and the ground-based uh, deterrent will be coming along. But there, you know, someone that had to uh, be the steward of that, the stewardship costs are significant. Our lab infrastructure uh, needs to be rationalized and, and invested in. So. Um, you know, the, the, the discussion that has been taking place is really quite superficial. Two years has not fixed everything. There are significant costs, and we're hopeful that the report um, uh, begins a, a, a lively debate about that. So we're going to ask one last question before I turn it over to, uh, to my Hopkins colleagues here. Um, and I'll, again, I'm going to ask you to be brief. Uh, on the nuclear question. Okay, stipulating the need to recapitalize uh, the nuclear arsenal, to modernize, all that sort of stuff. It still seems to me that the, one of the other striking things about the report is that there's quite an emphasis on nuclear weapons, that this, uh, this is a dimension of uh, the American arsenal that we have tended not to think a whole lot about. Um, and that, I don't think that's how it came across, at least in the report, that you actually think this is quite a, this is a very important part of the arsenal. Uh, that's a little bit scary, of course, in the context of a report that talks about the possibility of interstate war. So I was wondering if you could just talk about the strategic significance of a substantial and thoroughly modern nuclear arsenal, beyond the kind of expenditure that, that is necessary, with kind of a technical topic. To, to make sure that everything is functional and Same. the way you want it to be. So maybe, so, Master Edelman, General, uh, Admiral Ruffhead, and then I'm going to go so to Christine, Tom, and Mark. First, you know, my first kind of response, Elliot, to the question is that we were, of course, assessing the national defense strategy. And one of the things that is striking about the strategy is that it, uh, because it talks about great power competition, but also prioritizing how one would uh, if we had to fight how we would do it, basically says, you know, we, we'll, we're prepared to fight one uh, high-end adversary, but we would hold off other powers, essentially with our nuclear deterrence. So this strategy very explicitly puts more emphasis on the nuclear deterrent than was previously the case. Yeah. Um, again, in the period that we were in, the unipolar period from 92 on, uh, there was an assumption that, you know, great power competition had gone away. Nuclear weapons really weren't very relevant. And, and the Woody Hayes professor of national security at Ohio State University even wrote a whole book about the essential irrelevance of nuclear weapons. Um, the difficulty is now our two major adversaries are both engaged in very substantial nuclear modernization programs of their own. Um, and certainly in the case of Russia have talked quite a bit about the potential use of nuclear weapons. Uh, a lot of it, I think, is really loose and un, uh, uninformed talk. Uh, but it, 
you know, is worrisome because it betrays a mindset that suggests you might be able to actually use these things in a limited way without provoking greater escalation. So the importance of having what President Kennedy once called a uh, nuclear deterrent force second to none, I think, is probably as important now as it's ever been. Great. And Ruff, do you want to add I, anything to that? I agree. I mean, I think all of us would like to put the genie back in the bottle. But it's uh, not going not there. Going that way. Yeah. Um, I'll just ask my colleagues for one or two particular thoughts that you'd like to add. Uh, I don't know, do we have microphones? Yeah, if, could you bring, bring that forward? Give it first to Dr. Fox, then Dr. Mangan, then Professor Carlin. And welcome to SICE. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and it was a great honor to be a part of the commission. So uh, it, was, it was great. Um, so I would simply add, we've talked about readiness. We've talked about the implications of the budget years. I would like to just add in the implications on technology. I believe that uh, from, you know, when I was in the department, all of the effort has been on getting out any kind of fat out of the technology. No more delays, a perfect prediction of cost and schedule. And what that means is that DOD now that has achieved a lot of that and it's considered successful, we have also uh, taken out all any risk, which means we've taken out pretty much all the innovation. Because you simply cannot perfectly predict schedule and cost at the beginning of an innovative system that's pushing forward. At the same time, commercial technology has exploded, and the innovation is largely now in the commercial sector. And so what that means is that's available to anybody who has dollars, except perhaps the Defense Department, because they have to stick with the processes that we've had forever. So I see this um, as a conundrum. We talk about it in the report. I think it's something that we really need to get our arms around as a nation. How do we want our Defense Department to get access to this commercial innovation, to innovation in general, and how do we manage being good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars but still pushing innovation forward? I think that's something that's, that's got to be handled and, and very quickly. Great, thanks. Dr. Mankin. Oh, thanks. Uh, first, I mean, it was, it was a real pleasure to serve on the commission uh, with the other commissioners uh, and with, uh, with, with Paul Hughes and, this, and the staff. It was, it was, a, real, it was a real pleasure. Uh, I think the thing I would add is that the challenges that we face um, should be a surprise to absolutely nobody <laughs> because uh, they've been around for a long time. Uh, if, we, if we look at the sort of the list of strategic and operational challenges that we faced, it's, it's very much the same list that the Department of Defense itself provided in the 2001 Quadrennial Defense Review. So we're 17 years on. The challenges have gotten worse. We've done some things, but, but the net is that you know, we're, we're still pretty far behind. So it's not an issue of recognizing a, a challenge. It's not even, I, I would argue, fundamentally an issue of admiring a problem. I think as, as, uh, as Eric and, and Gary have said, and I think it reflect the, the consensus of the commissioners, the challenge now ahead of us is to do something about it. Uh, do something about it through, uh, through particular investments, through developing innovative operational concepts, changing the way we do business, and, and so forth. So what was once seen as a hypothetical future potential challenge is, is now a looming reality, and we need to do something about it. Thanks. Professor Carlin. Thanks. Um, it was also good fun to be a part of this. I would say um, commissions like this can suffer from two flaws. They can be irresponsible because you're not actually responsible for implementing anything, so you can just make it up, if you will. Uh, or they can be really vacuous because it's very easy not to say anything. You have to do a lot of work if you want to say something. And uh, I think what's so impressive about this effort is it actually suffered from neither flaw. Yeah. Great. Okay, so uh, we have, uh, we're going to break sharply at 10. Uh, I'm going to assume that that clock is accurate. I'm going to begin by privileging uh, SICE students and alumni. So I know there are journalists and so on here, and you'll get your shot too. But uh, first I'll just ask the, uh, for the first round, uh, SICE, current SICE students and recent alumni. Uh, and when you get the microphone, I'll ask you to identify yourself and you know, where you are, what you do. Uh, and I think we'll take a couple of questions uh, let Admiral Ruffhead and uh, Ambassador Edelman address them briefly, and then uh, go for another round. So, Thai students, recent students, current students, and recent alums. Okay, over there. <laughs> 
My name is Emma Bates. I'm a current uh, American foreign policy student here at SAIS. And my question is about mobilization. Um, what are your thoughts on how America could mobilize for the next war, given that our companies, our major companies, don't perhaps consider themselves solely American? And do you think that that affects our, the, the kinds of issues that you addressed in the report? Great. We're going to take two more questions, and then we'll over here. Uh, Admiral Ambassador, uh, thanks for being here and for your leadership on this important commission. Uh, Lieutenant Nick Radio, I'm a first year MA student. Um, uh, my question deals with, um, uh, uh, we're running out of time, uh, as, as is noted in the report, um, and, and the budget is kind of the key, the foundation that I see for all of this, and I think we are uh, indeed one CR away from not being able to recover. Um, so my question is, uh, this is not the first time that the budget has been uh, identified as this foundation, nor is it the first time uh, that a multi-year uh, defense budget has been suggested as a, a potential remedy. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, has the dialogue for that changed uh, in recent months, um, and how much was that discussed um, in your commission, and do you see it as a likely outcome? Thank you. Okay, we'll take uh, one more. I. Judd Crane, uh, also a recent SAIS alumni. Um, I want to expand a little bit on the mobilization question. Your review has articulated uh, that there is risk, and we've been spending two decades with a come-as-you-are perspective on how to approach our strategic challenges. Um, so does this suggest that a different model or evaluation um, on that come-as-you-are mindset would be appropriate, and how would you evaluate that? So basically, you had uh, two questions on different aspects of the mobilization issue, and then uh, a, a question about, you know, are we running out of time, especially on the budget, and is the idea of a multi-year defense budget uh, in play would, would make a big difference, bearing in mind some of the constitutional limitations uh, that are there on long-term budgets. Uh, who would like to start? Well, I'll take a crack uh, at it. So on mobilization, uh, one of the issues I think that preoccupied us was a question of potential simultaneity of conflict with great power rivals. Uh, when, when we raised this with our colleagues in the department, uh, that is to say the question of what happens if we end up not just fighting Russia or China and holding everybody else off, but for one reason or another we get into a conflict where we're having to deal with both Russia and China at the same time, which is not, I don't think, that far-fetched uh, you know, a contingency. Um, and, and honestly, I think there was sort of a kind of deer-in-the-headlights reaction in almost all cases, because the answers we got were, well, that would be like World War III, or that would be like World War II, or it would, it would require total national mobilization. And I think our response was, yes, well, that's why we probably need to start talking about it now. Um, the, the truth is that uh, if you look back at the 2010 and 2014 panels, we've actually raised this question in both panels, that we, we need to begin to think about national mobilization in a way that we haven't really, I think, in 40 or 50 years. Um, so uh, it's absolutely something that requires a national discussion and debate. I think we did get one question yesterday uh, in the SASC about that. I'm hoping that some folks in the House Armed <coughs> Services Committee, when we testify on the 6th of December, raise it uh, as well. On the budget, uh, I think it, it really, the issue you know, goes back to the uh, earlier conversation we had that, uh, that Elliot raised about, you know, does the Bipartisan Budget Act uh, two-year deal that just was completed that gave the Department of Defense $700 billion and then $716 billion for fiscal 18 and 19, you know, is that enough? And the good news is, I think, there was, with one exception yesterday, on the Senate Armed Services Committee, unanimity that that is not enough uh, and that um, the budget cannot be cut. Um, uh, or at a minimum, try and staunch the bleeding if they can. So I, I was somewhat encouraged, actually, by the uh, Senate uh, Armed Services Committee reaction. Um, but the uh, difficulty is going to be, and we'll know more, I think, about this um, when we get a sense on December 6th, is what happens now that the House has changed hands. 
and with a prospective chairman who's made it clear that he doesn't only want to cut as much as the president has suggested cutting, but wants to cut further. So I think that's sort of the, the challenge that we'll face. And the question, I think, that's out there is, with this new wave of uh, Democratic members who were elected in November, earlier in the month, rather, not yet December, um, whether the group of them that comes with military and intelligence experience can reconstitute what used to be called the Blue Dog Democratic Caucus, which provided a lot of bipartisan support for strong national defense. I think that's a, an unknown. It's a major question that's out there. And we'll have to see whether it um, uh, can happen. I mean, I, in recent days, I've talked to two former Blue Dogs, no longer in the Congress. And both of them were pretty bearish, actually, about the possibility of that happening because of the general direction that they see the Democratic Party moving in nationally. But, um, but I think many of those folks are in swing districts. Uh, many of them are in swing districts that have some significant military uh, installations and where defense spending is you know, probably pretty good politics for them. So we'll, we'll just have to see what can happen. On the multi-year budget question, I think we do have a recommendation in, year that, in there that the department be able to spend O&M money over two years rather uh, o than- O&M operations and maintenance. Maintenance money over two years. Um, uh, you know, I, as much as I'd like to see a multi-year budget for the Department of Defense, uh, I don't think you're gonna get it. Although I wouldn't rule out that you could get some kind of, if the president made it a priority, that you could get some kind of long-term, you know, not binding agreement, but some kind of long-term agreement on what the general kind of trend line would be of the budget over a period of time. There is, there is a constitutional issue. I mean, yeah, you've relimited I two years. I mean, it's... Right, and that's why I'm, I don't think it's yeah. possible to do it, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, your question on mobilization was terrific because it really touches on several things. Um, and... We, we, we address it in the report, but I think in the environment that we're describing, this peer uh, competition, uh, speed uh, has a different uh, context now. Uh, you know, the things will be happening much more quickly. So uh, not only how, how quickly can you mobilize, but I think the other thing that it brings into question are the models that we have for what capabilities are vested in our reserve component, what capabilities are in the active component. Um, how quickly can we move things to where they need to be? I would argue that you know, we have a lot of that uh, vested with our reserve component. The other thing that comes to mind, and this is just a personal observation of mine, when we were kind of peak in Iraq and Afghanistan, the economy wasn't doing very well. I, could, I had more reservists that wanted to do things than you can shake a stick at. When companies are humming, uh, when employment is full, um, you know, what will be the ability to tap into that reserve force and use that to, to surge? So I think you know, we need to look at not just the mobilization model, how it's constructed, how quickly do we want it to work, but then what's the reality of how that model will function over time uh, I think the other aspect of it that somewhat comes into play uh, is, you know, we in this community can be very satisfied that we understand what the challenges are. But I think the American people, the public, has a very different view. And this will get into the budget issue. The question of we have infrastructure, we have everything that needs to be paid for, um, you know, how are we going to do it? And so. In that regard, one of the things that we recommend in the report is, is declassifying some of the operational challenges, uh, having dealt uh, in another capacity on some space issues. How can we talk to the American people about what's really happening in space? We have some of that stuff classified when it really, in my view, need not be. And quite frankly, the American people need to understand what's at stake. So this also ties into mobilization because that, if people understand what the challenges are, uh, 
maybe the, the, the responses will be different. And then without beating a horse, um, the, the issue of industrial mobilization, which I think you also uh, alluded to, I, I, I believe the administration has recently done a study that begins to highlight that. But you know, this is where the devil is in the details. And how quickly can we produce some of the things that we know are going to be used in great quantities? And, uh, and, and good first step, but again, devil's in the details, and we have to be prepared for ugly news so that we can get on about fixing it. So we're coming to the end, and I think rather than take the um, last round of questions, let me just ask uh, the two of you, are there any other top lines from this report that I didn't ask you about or uh, you were not asked about here that you think you'd really like to headline as uh, things that are in this report which are really important that you would like people to, to pay attention to? You know, Christine mentioned it, and the question on mobilization touched on it, and Gary just, you know, touched on it as well, which is in another way in which the period of time we're entering is different from a lot of what we've dealt with in the past is that um, the, develop, the relationship between technological development in the Department of Defense and the commercial economy is flipping. I mean, in, in the 1950s and 60s, a lot of industrial development took place on the back of what the Department of Defense was doing. Uh, today, the Department of Defense is going to be much more of a, uh, a consumer rather than a creator of, of some of this. Uh, yet we do face some resistance from, certainly in the IT area, from companies uh, in terms of cooperating with the Department of Defense. And I think we have to have a national discussion about that. Yeah. Um, in, in particular because in some of these cases, not all, but in some cases some of these companies' platforms are being used as weapons against us. And yet they're not willing to you know, agree to work with the government um, you know, to defend us. You know, that, that just strikes me as wrong. I, and you know, I think we're going to have to figure out a way to get around that. I, I recently uh, asked a Google executive at a conference, so China, yes, Department of Defense, no. I mean, that's, in a way, that's one of the things that, that, that you face with some of the companies out yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Sir? No, I, I think that the, this idea of how the world is changing technologically um, has uh, broader security issues. And, um, and we need to think simply beyond the defense implications, because as you look at um, the technology that particularly is coming out of China and how that technology is being implemented, where you find that technology taking hold in countries that uh, we have relationships with. Um, you know, we uh, need to think about how we incentivize partners and friends to make sure um, that they stay on side. Because in, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you could say, okay, country X, go buy an air defense system from Russia and you know, you'll buy everything else from us, everything will be fine. But today when you network all of that together, it's not the same uh, thing. And, and we need to think about how we handle those situations, uh, what we are ready to do to enhance cooperation uh, with countries that may be pulled in another area. Uh, with regard to that, because the, the warfare of the future is clearly going to be far more integrated, and and we have to th be able to think in what that integrated uh, architecture is. Great. Well, what's left uh, for me to do is to uh, thank both of you for being here. I want to thank uh, colleagues and staff who put this together. I particularly want to thank Professor Carlin, who orchestrated not only this, but uh, Secretary Mattis's rollout of the MDS. And I, I do want to say that um, you know, th this great university has a global mission, uh, knowledge for the world, but it also has an American mission. Uh, and it's a great source of pride that, you know, it's not just the applied physics lab, but uh, it's also a place like SICE that's uh, part of that. And that's 
represented by having all of us uh, here in this room today. So with that, let me thank our guests. Thanks.